this is Captain Chaudhary once again. Welcome to the part 2 of Polar Navigation. In my previous session about Polar Navigation, I talked about the basic difficulties in navigation which you will encounter in higher latitudes. But here in uh, this part 2 of my video of Polar Navigation, I want to look at the uh, entire scenario in a different way, with a different perspective. In the yester years, definitely there was an element of adventure when you went to the higher latitudes or uh, polar areas. But now it has become a kind of necessity, it has become a trend. It is like uh, uh, new routes are found, you know, uh, going from Arctic to Pacific. Large number of passenger ships are also venturing uh, through these areas. Uh, this is because of the demand from the passengers to visit the exotic areas. IMO has come out with an assembly resolution 999 of 25th assembly. This is in the year 2007. This is to guide the passenger vessels who tend to venture in more and more remote areas. Particularly, I think the Arctic was in mind. So can I say, IMO in the recent years is doing a lot of things about these high latitudes. Let's learn about that. Let us try and understand what are these Arctic and Antarctic areas. Well, Antarctic is very simple. The areas south of 60 degree south, you know, uh, the entire area up to South Pole, it is Antarctic. But in case of Arctic, because of the distribution of landmass, because of some population in high latitudes, uh, uh, there is a slight difference. Let us see how Arctic is defined in Solas. Let us start from a point say 58 degrees north and 42 degrees west. From this point we go along set of uh, ram lines till we reach 73.5 degrees north and 19 degrees east by the island of Jornoya. Then by a great circle till we reach 68.64 degrees north that is Cape Canaan. And then you go along the northern coast of uh, Asian continent till Bering Strait. And from the Bering Strait you go westward till the parallel of 60 degrees north and then you have to follow the parallel of 60 degrees north move eastwards and thence you follow the north coast of North America till you come down to 60 degrees north once again and thence you continue eastwards generally along the parallel of 60 degrees till you reach the original position from where we started. So the area that is bound by this traversing which I explained you just now that is the Arctic. That is the Arctic as defined in Solas. So let us understand what uh, what are the legal requirements in respect of this area, whether it is Antarctic or Arctic. The polar code applies to both. What are the routes in Arctic? Well, there are three main routes in Arctic. In the western part, you have Northwest Passage. In the eastern part, you have Northeast Passage. And then there is a route which is rather less used or it is seldom used and that is the North Polar route passing from in between almost through the poles. Apart from these three main uh, routes, you have two more routes. One is called Arctic Sea Bridge or Arctic Bridge and another one is North Sea Passage or North Sea Route. North Sea Route is a route that hugs the Russian coast and on the eastern side you have Bering Strait whereas on the western side you have Kara Sea. Whereas uh, this Arctic Bridge, Arctic Bridge is an internal route connecting Canada and Russia. Ships operating in polar areas, do they have to comply with any additional legal uh, regulations, obligations? The answer is yes. There is this code for ships which are operating in polar areas, polar code. Now this polar code has become mandatory as per the SOLAS as well as MARPOL. So, uh, those ships which operate in polar areas, they must comply with polar code. Polar code covers the matters in respect of construction, design, equipment, operations, training, search and rescue and environmental protection. And as you know, polar code entered in force from 1st January 2017. The ships need to carry polar water operational manual. And this manual is supposed to guide the owner, master, crew, etc. in respect of operational capabilities of the ships and uh, limitations so that they are able to make appropriate decision in respect of the ship. So what certificates must the ship carry? Code wants that the ship should carry 
polar ship certificate. Polar ship certificate would classify the ships into say type A which is designed to maneuver in uh, medium first year ice which may include the old ice. So type A ship is a ship which could not be classified as type A ship but designed to maneuver in thin first year ice which may include the old ice. And then there is this type C ship which uh, is not classified as type A and type B. It is designed to maneuver in open water or in the IZ water which are less severe than type A and type B. What is the layout of polar code? Can we say broadly we can divide the polar code in two parts. One is the mandatory provisions and other one is recommendatory provisions. So under mandatory you have 1A covering the safety issues and 2A covering the pollution prevention related issues. Again you have 1B and 2B which are the recommendatory issues connected to 1A and 2A. Part 1A has different chapters like for example general uh, polar water operating manual, ship structure, uh, subdivision and stability, watertight and weathertight uh, integrity, fire safety measures, machinery construction, the uh, life saving appliances and arrangements. Then you have safety of navigation, communication, uh, manning, training, voice planning. Part 2A has got chapters like prevention of pollution by oil, prevention of pollution by noxious substances carried in bulk, noxious substances carried in packaged form, then sewage and prevention of pollution from garbage. Let us now try and understand the safety measures which were taken by IMO in respect of say uh, uh, reporting, in respect of routing measure. So MSC in 2012 established Behrens SRS. As per this, the ships, certain ships which are uh, navigating in the Behrens Sea area or uh, arriving or departing from the ports in Behrens Sea. They are supposed to report to Wardo VTS Center or Murmans VTS Center. Now uh, certain ships say for example of gross tonnage more than 5000, any oil tanker, a towing vessel if the length of the tow is more than 200 meters, a vessel not in a command or a vessel restricted in ability to maneuver or any vessel with the defective means of uh, any kind of defect in navigation or uh, machinery etc. They are supposed to report to uh, one of these two centers. MSC in 2018 adopted routing measures in Bering Sea and Bering Strait. So this was the first time that the routing measures were incorporated in an area that was covered by polar code. So these measures included six two-way routes and six precautionary areas. MSC also uh, identified three of the areas which must be avoided by the ships. IMO assembly in the month of November, December 2019 adopted a resolution by which they urged the member states to implement the principles and measures of polar code you know on a voluntary basis to the ships which are not covered by SOLAS. We have been talking about navigation and navigation related measures which have been taken in polar areas but uh, at the same time we should also see what changes or what new measures have been uh, established in polar areas say in respect of stability and damage stability. We need to know uh, what allowance is made for stability for the exposed areas say deck, gangway etc. We allow 30 kg per meter square and then there are uh, lateral areas which are projected above the water line. For those areas we allow 15 kg per meter square as allowance. Then there are some discontinuous uh, surfaces for example railings, booms etc. So uh, what allowance has to be done for these uh, discontinuous surfaces? So whatever is the continuous projected surface that area is increased by 5% for the weight and it is increased by 10% for the moments which it can provide. Now what is the requirement in respect of uh, damage liberty? So ships of type A and B which are constructed after 1st January 2017, they should have survivability and residual stability in respect of uh, an ice damage. So uh, if you consider the survivability index as given in Chapter 2 1 of SOLAS, the survivability index after an ice impact and damage should be 1 or 100% in all loaded conditions.
those cargo ships which are complying with other regulations of subdivision and uh, damage stability criteria they should have required residual stability for all the conditions of loading when the ship comes to polar areas let us now understand uh, what are the requirements in respect of ice accretion on deck so what arrangements should be made to start with the ship should be constructed in such a way that uh, there is a minimum scope for ice accretion or the construction of the ship should be such that uh, there is no large ice accretion on the ship and then there should be pneumatic or electric uh, devices which should be provided to remove the ice from deck including the axis wooden clubs etc uh, as the administration requires then for the conic position you should provide two clear view screens you know and the screen should be such uh, that they provide uninterrupted forward and astern view now if you have a screen whose weather side or front side may be affected by ice snow or uh, freezing rain mist etc then there should be arrangement to clear it and those arrangements which are placed on outer side they should be such that the arrangement itself or the mechanical device itself should be protected from the ice on the other side uh, uh, that means on the inner side of the screen where you might have the condensation or deposition of water etc there should be arrangement to clear it where the equipment uh, that are required by chapter 5 safety of navigation of solas or this particular chapter which deals with uh, the subject when uh, 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 when these chapters require any uh, sensor to be protruding outside the hull under water then there should be arrangements made to protect such sensors equipment and system should retain their functionality in the extreme weather that prevails in polar areas fire system and appliances which are there in exposed areas should be protected from ice accretion and the material that is used for uh, these fire appliances etc should be suitable for the extreme climate all life saving appliances and associated equipment should be suitable appropriate for safe evacuation and they should be functional in the extreme temperature let us now look at the requirement in respect of personal survival equipment and group survival equipment whether it is personal or a group survival equipment they should provide effective protection against the wind chill now uh, group survival equipment should be carried unless equivalent safety is provided by the personal survival equipment when required the personal as well as group survival equipment sufficient for 110% of the persons on board should be uh, kept in easily accessible position now the containers for these group survival equipment should be such that they can float in water and they can be easily carried over ice now in the polar areas you can't have life boat that is of open type either it should be partially enclosed or fully enclosed and then if you are supposed to carry any equipment in these life boats then the launching appliances as well as the life boat should be of the capacity to carry those equipment in addition to the persons now let us look at what uh, uh, electronic or communication related uh, equipment are additionally required in polar areas so uh, you should have uh, uh, ability of receiving the ice related information in fact you should be able to display that information or you should be able to visualize that information in respect of ice in the areas ship shell have ability to detect the ice visually in the night time ships involved in operations with ice breakers should have capability of uh, a flashlight flashing light at stern area this red flashing light is manually initiated and it shows that the ship uh, is stopped over the water so uh, it should be visible in the aft area so that the ships in the convoy the other ships in convoy as well as ice breaker knows that the ship is stopped in water ships operating in polar areas should have efficient means of communication so that they can freely communicate with shore other ships sar facilities etc and their routing should be such that throughout the passage throughout the passage uh, in the polar areas there is a uh, compatibility in respect of communication which means that communication capability should be available throughout the route in respect of communication with escort vessels or sar uh, facilities efficient means of two way communication should be provided on the ship this includes the communication capability for medical evacuation 
and also the arrangements which are provided on the ship. They should be uh, capable of not only communication but also uh, data transfer. And also uh, the communication should be possible on the frequencies like 121.5 and 123.1 megahertz so that you can communicate with the uh, aircraft facilities. Now let us look at the requirement from the icebreaker point of view. They should have a sound signaling appliance at the stern part you know, so that they can uh, give a uh, sound signal and this appliance should be facing aft so that the ships uh, which are in convoy, they uh, are able to uh, get the emergency instructions from the icebreaker. Now let us look at the communication facilities which should be available on uh, any survival craft, rescue boat, lifeboat, etc. So uh, any survival craft should have uh, means to uh, communicate with SAR facilities. To receive or transmit on scene communications. Apart from this, they should have a device which will give a homing signal or a locating, position locating signal from the craft. In addition to this, uh, if it is a rescue boat or it is a lifeboat, you should have, in addition to what I said just now, you should also have a means to communicate the distress signal. Now, let us look at the navigational aspect. What is required on the ships in polar areas? You should have two eco sounders or if you have one eco sounder, then there should be two independent transducers. Now the ships which are navigating in the areas where you have 24 hours uh, daylight, other than those uh, ships, uh, you need to have two narrow beam searchlights which are operable, controllable from the bridge so that you are able to detect the ice in the night time. A clear view screen at least two on the bridge front and depending on the configuration of the bridge you need to have a clear view screen on the stern side also. Systems which are provided for reference heading as well as position fixing should be appropriate for the area in which the ship is navigating. Ship in polar waters must be provided with two non-magnetic means of determining and displaying the heading. Please note determining and displaying the heading. Determination of the heading must be by non-magnetic means and displaying could be on say radar or EGDIS etc. But uh, you need to have the two means independent and both be supplied by main and emergency power supply. The ships which need to proceed north of 80 degrees north, they must be provided with GNSS compass or an equivalent supplied with both main and emergency power supply. I hope this video has given you a good idea in respect of what is the requirement in polar areas as far as the navigation is concerned, as far as the communication is concerned. I will see you in the next video when we talk about the facilities which are available and what are the new things which have been incorporated with polar waters to make the navigation safer in polar waters. Thank mm -hmm. you.